the spirit searches the deep things of God. And that's what this is about. We're searched out by the bright shining light, but the spirit, right, who searches the deep things of God wants to reveal to us the things that are freely given to us by God. And, and so now this is where this turns at this place where every one of you would say, I know that the spirit of God revealed this. And the second part, he gave it to me. Do you hear that? Jeff, does anything from the scriptures come other than revelation from God? No. Anything by your great study? Not at all. Not no. a bit. <clears throat> are you, are, do you do any great study or do you have a great no, God? I, that do, I do the work, but then I lay it at his feet and I got nothing. Yep. But so this comes doing. by revelation of God. Mm -hmm. So I've asked Jeff to pray for us. And this is this where anybody hanging out up there who's not in here? That's got to be in here? Who's supposed to be in here? Come on, here, boys. Come on. <laughs> Anybody want to be outside of this work this weekend? I wouldn't want to be found outside of this. Okay. And if you're hiding out in here, no longer hiding, right? That's right. We're in the light. So I've asked Jeff to pray for us. He's going to teach, and then he's probably going to pray again, and we'll probably keep praying. But this is what has to happen for us, okay? Anybody know where my Bible went? Was up here. It's on the table in the back room on the right. Okay. All right. I'll get that afterwards. All right. Let's cut it over to Jeff. All right. All right. Well, Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, your grace, Lord. Where else would we be if we weren't here? We'd be sitting out in front of the TV. We'd be at a bar. We'd be hung over. Lord, who knows where we would be if it wasn't for your divine work of grace in our lives. And as uh, Seth said, well, we don't bring anything but a train wreck to the cross. And we see what you do, Lord. You redeem it. Lord, that is the whole purpose for this creation is redemption. Lord, you, you are the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And Lord, you came into this world. You knew the fall, Lord, was pre-planned and knew what was going to happen in advance. And the redemption was pre-planned, Lord, of that fall. And God, as we're looking at this study today. I do pray that you would wash over us with your word, especially as we're looking at the words of Peter. And, and that is exactly what he's talking. And maybe it sounds redundant after a while, but it's supposed to be because that's what we have. And so, Lord, speak to us. And fill us, Lord, with understanding, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to be in Second Peter chapter 3. I got to sit, not just because I'm tired and I hate standing up, but <laughs> I've been dealing with epilepsy for about 17 years. And if I stand a while, I can give vertigo, stuff like that. And just something the Lord has used in my life to... Uh, to Just push pause. Push pause. We can't hear you very well, so it will be up to, to Yeah. The well, anyway. <clears throat> there we go. How's that? Yeah, anyway, I think the Lord used it to just make me eat right because I'm on a really strict diet, so I haven't had bread in over 10 years. I try that sometimes. <laughs> Sugar. That's tough. I can have all the bacon I want, so it's a good, it's a good, you know, diet. So it's all right. Yeah, <laughs> it works. I got a great wife who knows how to cook great. So, but, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. The first neurologist I saw in Madison, Ann Weiss, a tiny little Jewish woman. And I went to see her and She's taking all my history. She's writing down now, Mr. Sowell, do you know, do you, uh, have you ever been in any car accidents? And I said, well, yeah, pretty much about like 10, or totaled. Have you ever um, experimented with alcohol or drugs? Yeah, I was, I was pretty much drank every day, did drugs constantly. I was very foolish in my younger days. That's the way I lived. Oh, and she says, it sounds like it was in the past. About what, well, what time did that end? I said, well, it ended actually January 4th, 1993 at 8 o'clock at night. And she put her pen down and, <laughs> and what happened then? 
that's where the Lord just says, okay, you're up. I said, I received your Messiah as my Savior. I've never drank or done drugs again. He took away 15 years of smoking cigarettes in one night. And uh, she's like, that is amazing. And I said, do you even realize your heritage? You can trace back your heritage 4,000 years. As I trace back my heritage, some guy got drunk here in Fargo and got my grandma pregnant. I don't know, you know, that's as far as I never met my grandparents. But there is a town called Holly, you know where that's at, that's nearby, and they have a, a Solwald Lake. And so last time we were here, my wife and I went to look at it, and it was pretty pathetic, so it kind of, <laughs> I was like, I don't think that's a lake, you know. <laughs> But it kind of sets the tone for our family, I think, so <laughs> there you go. But uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct in godliness, looking for, hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now, I'm always blessed to be able to come here a second time, but to serve with Seth and Chick, I've known them for over 20 years, and they're just faithful brothers in the Lord, faithful pastors. Sean is a great extra bonus because he used to serve in Calvary Chapel, Madison. And so to be able to come and serve with him is just a real blessing as well. But, um, you know, Seth called up, he says, we're having a conference, and he gives you one word, continue. Okay, it's like... All right, what do you do with that, Lord? I mean, that's, you know, it's pretty broad, but at the same time, it's a, it's a real challenge because you're just like, God, you know, what do you do? It makes you, you know, really stop and, and seek the Lord. And this is what he put on my heart because, and, and it's, it seems a little redundant, but at the same time, that's kind of the tone of this epistle, as we'll see here. The way this epistle is constructed Chapters 1 and 3 have parallel themes, while chapter 2 contains the heart or the main focus of the letter, with a warning to believers of false teachers that will infiltrate the Lord's earthly church, and, and they have, man, I'm like, I don't need to tell anyone this. There will be false teachers among you, Peter says, in verse 1 of chapter 3, and then he says, you know, even as... There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words for a long time. Their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. Now, while chapter 2 contains this lengthy warning regarding the infiltration of false teachers, both chapters 1 and 3 emphasize what Peter saw as his apostolic ministry, at least when it came to writing epistles, which was to remind followers of Jesus Christ to grow in, to hold fast to, and to continue in the Word of God. Now, look at chapter 1. If you turn to chapter 1, verse 2, he opens the epistle, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This is how he opens the epistle. He said, through the knowledge, grace and peace will be multiplied to me, he says, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Speaking of knowledge that comes through God's word. Not through just watching The Chosen or going to Christian concerts or like, you know, idolizing Christian celebrities. You know, some of those things aren't necessarily bad, but, you know, for many people, that is their Christianity. You know, I read an interview a couple weeks ago with the people who make the TV show The Chosen, 
And, you know, I've only seen it a couple times because I just read the Bible like Sean was saying, dude, this is what I got. Why do I want the TV version, the sitcom, you know? But the producers of that show were all excited in this interview because according to their research, over half of their audience are unbelievers. They were all giddy. It's not like they're getting saved, but that's their entertainment. Unbelievers. They can put it on and not get convicted by the Holy Spirit and watch Jesus as their <clears throat> nighttime entertainment. Just like you're watching Leave it to Beaver. I thought, this is sad. It's a form of godliness, but denies the power thereof. The knowledge Peter talks about here is that which comes from Scripture. Verse 3 of chapter 1, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So right from the beginning of an epistle written to warn believers of the influx of false teaching that will come against the church, he doesn't start listing all the false teachers. In both the first and third chapters of this, the parallel chapters, all he's doing is reminding believers, you just stay in the Word and be grounded in the Word. The false teachers are going to come and go, but you're, you're going you're to spot them a mile away. Peter puts all the emphasis upon growing my knowledge of God through the exceedingly great and precious promises that I have been given here in his word because it is through my taking hold of these promises of God, he says, that I partake of the, di the divine nature, that which has been placed within me at conversion through his Holy Spirit by which he says, I have escaped the corruption of the world around me. Not by entering, you know, monasteries. Some people think, I, I can escape if I'm just alone or I go, you know, to live with the Amish or something like that. There's, there's plenty of corruption there. But only through the power of the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God will I be able to overcome this lust of the flesh? And that's why I don't think it's any coincidence the way that this conference has progressed. Because, you know, here we're learning, you know, from Jake, dude, lay it out, you're a sinner. I hate to tell you, you know, if you don't already know that. Sean comes up and says we're in a con constant battle. This man comes up and tells me I can't hear you. <laughs> no, no, just that way it's not bothering you. Anymore. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Perfect. It's only through the Word of God. You know, I think there was a common theme. Did I battle lust? You know, a few years ago. There was this fad, people were taking pot-bellied pigs into their homes as pets. I don't know if you remember this. It was a fad, it, it didn't last very long. They, they bought into this marketing pit, pitch, you know, it's a cute little cuddly animals, they make great house guests. Many people found out they're, they're farm animals and they grow to become 200 pounds and they act like pigs and they eat like pigs. This fad was especially big on the East Coast, and according to Wall Street Journal, the state of Delaware has now developed a major problem with wild pot belly pigs. <laughs> Evidently, when people got sick of them, you know, instead of just killing them, they, they dump them in the woods. It's like, well, well, let's let them go free. Dude, it's a farm animal, okay? They don't go free, they get eaten by another animal. But they're being overrun by these things in Delaware because they breed at like several months old. They end up digging up, destroying their crops, leaving fecal matter in the rivers and the streams, con contaminating everything. It turns out it wasn't a really good idea. And no different than somebody thinking, I can live with just a little lust. And just a little in my life. Think I can manage it and control it only to find out I can't escape the corruption of the world around me brought on by this lust except through the divine power 
that I have been given access to. It's not mine, it's his power. I've been given access to it at conversion, and that can only be employed by growing in, walking in, and assimilating this scripture that I've been given. These precious promises. Verses 5 through 7 of chapter 1, they include a list of spiritual characteristics that need to be added. He says at verse 5, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add your faith virtue to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, self-control perseverance, perseverance godliness, godliness brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness love. So it's not just information I'm gathering, it's a manner of life. And he maps it out here, Peter does. Because if it's not, you know, if this is not being lived out, if these characteristics of spiritual maturity are lacking in my life, verse 9 says, I will end up spiritually blind. See, if I'm not growing, I can come to a conference and get all excited and everything else, dude. But if I don't start developing these spiritual characteristics through the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, dude, he says here, you can forget even the most fundamental principles of your Christian faith in verse 9. He who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness. You wonder how people backslide and walk away? I mean, dude, as a pastor, you know, you, you see those people in the store, you know, and they see you and they pretend like they never saw you before. They were at church, you know, for a long time. And I remember seeing this guy go past the aisle at the uh, um, Menards and, you know, he goes past the aisle. He looks up the aisle. I'm coming down the aisle. He looks at me and he gets a shock, but then he just looks forward and he keeps going. <laughs> Hey, man, how you doing? I caught up with him, and he's like, Oh, oh, hi, Pastor Jeff, how you doing? I'm doing great. So, so what are you doing here? God sent me here to talk to you, man. <laughs> and dude, his face got beat red, you know? But it's like that's what happens. He forgets even the most fundamental principles of your Christian faith, thinking it's enough to just watch the chosen and listen to Phil Wickham, dude, and I'm a Christian. It'd be easy prey for deception. Therefore, verse 10, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You talk about exceedingly great and precious promises. I will never stumble. And an entrance will be supplied for me abundantly into the Lord's everlasting kingdom. For this reason, Peter says, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. That's why a retreat like this is great. Just be reiterated. I know you know these things, you got good pastors, but to be established in the present truth, yes, I think it's right, verse 13, as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. The reminder Peter refers to in verse 12 is what we have in these New Testament epistles, 1 and 2 Peter. It would be negligence on his part, he says in verse 12, as an apostle of Jesus Christ who sat at his feet, what am I to leave with the body of Christ before I die? It would be negligent for me to not remind you always that God's divine power has been given to me, has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of God's, through his word here in the Bible. And he goes on at the end of chapter 1 to express how if I am wise, I will hold fast and heed the, pro the prophetic word confirmed, he calls it in verse 19, that's a light that shines in a very dark place, speaking of the world around us. Such adherence to God's word is essential because false teachers are going to come along. Not they might come along or maybe they will come along and they have come along. Every New Testament book, except for the short epistle of Philemon, warns followers of Jesus Christ 
against false teachers. That is a part and parcel with the church. And that's what Peter does here in chapter 2 of 2 Peter. He digresses from this reminder of exhorting believers to hold fast to the Word of God. He digresses in chapter 2, includes a lengthy, very strong warning against false teachers. But in chapter 3, he returns to his primary ministry, primary point of his epistle, back in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, reminding believers Beloved, he says in verse 1 of chapter 3, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. In both of them, both epistles I'm writing, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days just like they did in Nehemiah's day, walking according to their own lusts. And so here, he said, the return here to the beginning of the chapter is mentioned, is marked by what is called a literary formality. It's like he's returning to the main topic of the epistle. Is marked by his formal return of topic in the epistle. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle. It's like, now, as I was saying, after giving this warning, now, as I was saying, be mindful, he says here, or literally have your mind filled with the words which were spoken by the holy prophets, <coughs> speaking of the writers of the Old Testament, and with the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, the writers of the New Testament. It's so easy to get distracted by so many things. The average person checks their phone 352 times a day. That's average. You know, how many times am I checking my phone? I remember teaching at a conference a few years ago, and I mentioned I read through the Bible every two months. And this pastor was there, and, and he's like, I almost spilled my coffee. I thought, yeah, right pretty presumptuous. He said, I went back, I googled in my room, how, you know, how many words on average does, you know, just reading through a book, how many words, you know, per minute does somebody read? And then he googled how many words are in the Bible. And he said, I did the math, dude, it takes an hour a day to read through the Bible every two months. He said, what am I doing with my time? How many times have you read through the Bible? I talked to Christians who are 20 years old, never read through the Bible, let alone seven times a year. And people think, oh, that's extravagant. Why? You check your phone 352 times. You watch The Chosen, dude, read your Bible, you know. <laughs> it's like a lot more edifying. And, it, you know, there's great ways to do it where you can go through. I remember a church in Madison, they had a one-year challenge to read the Bible. It's like, I dare you. It's like, give me a break, dude. You don't love reading the Word of God? Then, uh, you know, why, why do you even go to church if it's such a hassle? This is the most important primary thing to know. Knowing this first, he says in verse 3 of chapter 3. Knowing this first, it's scoffers. This is why scoffers are going to come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers have fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Jude makes reference to the same thing, Jude verse 18. There's going to be mockers in the last time. Both of them are talking of the days we're living in. Like Sean was saying, you know, I mean, Nehemiah dealt with this. You know, David dealt with it. The apostles dealt with it. We dealt with it. We'll deal with it. And, you know, he's putting this into context why it's so important to have my mind continually being filled with the Word of God because my faith in the truth is going to come under assault by those who are abandoned to their own self-pleasure. They've cast off all restraint. They don't care what you do or say. They're going to call into question the reliability of these exceedingly great and precious promises of God that I have built my life upon, and it's, it's so important to know why. why. Why have I built my life upon it? Just because my pastor says I should? Do I know the reliability of Scripture? 
I've been teaching in prisons about 12 years. I was in one Monday night. I was sitting I could tell the guys, you know, I'm teaching a Bible study. And, you know, they're just like, they're kind of getting it. And then I finally just stopped and I said, guys, do you even know why the Bible is the inerrant word of God? Do you even know why it's sufficient? And they just had a blank stare on their face. They didn't know. I realized, you know, they're just, they could come to the, the Quran Bible study or the Quran study and have the same thing. And I said, I went through the acronym maps, the manuscripts, archaeology, predictive prophecies, statistical probability acronym that you can look and find, you know, how reliable the Bible is. And they're writing that down. I said, next, because they get in debates with Muslims and Buddhists and everyone. Why should I believe your Bible? Hey, this other guy's got his religious book. Well, there's a, a lot of difference, you know, when you get into that and should study it because it'll increase your faith you know, ex ex exponentially. The promise here to prophecy is what it is, that the time is going to come in the last days that people will mock the promise of the second coming of Jesus Christ, using as their basis for unbelief the denial of a worldwide flood. It says in verse 5, For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. The fact that God judged the world previously through water Verse 6, when the world became consumed with wickedness, that is proof that he will judge the earth again, as predicted only this time with fire, when it becomes filled with wickedness. Now read about what it was like before the flood. Every thought and intention of man's heart was only wicked all the time. I remember as a new believer even 30 years ago, thinking, wow, dude, I can't even imagine what that'd be like. I can now, I can totally imagine it now. Since the internet's come on the scene and everything, that is, that is all people in their, in their intention. People scoffing at or mocking belief in the Bible and the biblical account of the world flood, ironically, they're helping you know, make the case for the validity of Scripture because they prophesy that's what they're going to do. But this physical creation, as it exists in its present form here on earth with people walking according to their own lusts, mocking God, it's being stored up, is what the Greek word translated preserved in verse 7 means. It's a Greek word that was used for how someone would accumulate treasure. So not only are things in this world not just going along as they always have for billions of years, as modern day scoffers want to believe, but things are building up. They're going to come to a head once again, just as they did at the time of the flood. Something is becoming more and more obvious as scoffers, you know, increase challenging God and his word, as it says here. As I'm continuing on in my walk with the Lord, there's never going to be a lack for scoffers, people scoffing who foolishly speak against their creator and live in rebellion to him. But see, with Peter, he's not so much concerned with debating them as he is with building up, instructing the faithful. If I don't remember anything else, don't forget this one thing, he says in verse 8, quoting Psalm 90. This is an important point to remember. When I'm you know, on the job site or I'm with my unsaved family, he quotes Psalm 90, a Psalm of Moses, where Moses, 3,500 years ago, dealt with the relativity of time as that pertains to God. This is why it's futile. He's saying it's futile to debate the unbeliever who questions or mocks the timing of God's fulfillment of his great and precious promises. They're just showing their ignorance with regards to the nature of an eternal God who is not subject to time as we are. You think, what will it be like to exist in, in, outside of time? Which is what we will, when we get raptured, when we're with the Lord, we can only theorize presently what that would be like because we are stuck with having to abide by a continual ticking of a clock and having to adjust our lives 
to that as we did last week with daylight savings. Or after a few weeks ago, there was an extra day added for leap year. But that's nothing. Over the past 50 years, 27 leap seconds have had to be added to keep the world running smoothly. Airlines, satellites, major tech companies all rely on the addition of a second to global time at certain intervals so as to not be thrown off course. That's how delicate the whole system is. In 2015, the entire global stock market had to stop for just one second simultaneously just to avoid a fluctuation in the global financial markets. That's how delicate it is. That's how bound to time we are. The literal rendering of an Old Testament passage Peter's alluding to, Psalm 90, verse 4, says literally a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past. God doesn't see a thousand years consecutively like we do. He sees a thousand years are in his sight all at once. He knows what's going to take place before it happens. It's like yesterday before it's past. And so the Lord is not slack. See, this is why if you remember nothing, remember when you're talking to that ignorant person. I was that ignorant person before. Oh yeah, when's God going to come? You know, the Lord's not slack concerning these promises as a presumption of the ignorant, the fact that God has not brought about the fulfillment of his plans is not due to some kind of failure or inability, but what is considered a delay from the perspective of this time-oriented world is in reality his long-suffering, he says, in verse 9. That's just God's grace. An extended period of grace being given to sinful humanity to allow the opportunity for people not to perish. But that should, you know, but that all should come to repentance. Not all do come to repentance, as it's pointed out in verse 7. But that's not God's will. Those who perish, along with the rest of the present creation, do so in defiance to God's desires. Scoffers are mocking the very means of their own salvation. It's not like I have to view people, these poor people, dude, they're... They're mocking the very means of their own salvation, mocking it. And you know Revelation is going to get to a point where they are cursing God, their means of salvation. You know, the cross is God's way of saying, if you go to hell, you're going over my dead body. That is how loving God is and how gracious. The reason for this whole extravagant process is because God is establishing an eternal kingdom. He's not establishing what's here on earth. The cost of that eternal kingdom may seem too high to those who only want to serve themselves and who will never experience true life, but to God, the price is totally worth it. For the redeemed, for us, it's totally worth going through all the mocking and the rebellion, the whole creation, dude, of a whole universe, physical universe, those who join him in his everlasting kingdom, all of it is worth the redeemed joining him. When the final person is saved, then this temporary world will have accomplished that for which God created it, which is to produce redeemed human beings made in his image who will participate in what he is currently preparing for us. I've got to keep that mindset that you know, that's not in this world. I'm, I'm laying them treasures in heaven, a future kingdom that to God is worth the present price being paid. It's way worth it for the joy set before him, the mocking, the scoffing, his becoming a human being to bring our redemption, redemption to establish our part in it. Imagine what that is going to be like when we are with him. I may not understand the extent of it or the complexities involved of this present aspect, but he tells me up front, Jeff, my ways are not your ways. My ways are beyond your finding out, Isaiah 55. And I look around, I just see the intricacy of creation. I'm driving up here from Wisconsin, just beauty out in places where no one's ever going to see it. I've been in the Amazon jungle six times. They got plants there that will never see any other continent 
That's why I went there. I went there with a world-renowned botanist, and he took me there, and we went into the jungle, and you go two hours, you see the same different plants all the way along. He says, this is the only place in the world where you'll see these plants. No one else sees them unless you take a boat there. And you're going by, you're going, this is amazing. God just sprinkles this stuff onto this planet. Like, that's just his creative genius. His ways are not my ways. And, you know, I, I don't doubt that. But it must be pretty awesome if God is willing to put up with so much just to bring about our participation with him in his eternal kingdom. The conjunction in verse 10 is continuative. So literally, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come, or for, because. It's like, remember this, because. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it, they're just going to burn up. This is what the coming judgment just referred to consists of. The phrase day of the Lord is used by Old Testament prophets as well as Jesus himself to speak of his eventual coming in judgment so as to set up a thousand year reign on this earth. Both Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, Paul the Apostle, 1 Thessalonians 5.2, along with Peter here, they all describe the unexpectedness of what awaits. Not that God's trying to surprise anybody or to catch people off guard. He's done everything he can to warn and to give advance notice as he does here. The Lord's return is the subject of multiple passages over Scripture over thousands of years. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. The shock and surprise of it will be due to the unwillingness of unbelieving world to take heed. When Alexander the Great... He would lay siege to a city. He would light a large lamp and he would keep it burning day and night. The people in the city were told, as long as that lamp is lit, you got time to save yourself. Just surrender. But once that lamp goes out, the city, everything in it is going to be destroyed. It's up to you. God has done the same thing. He's lit the lamp of his word, so to speak, inviting people to be saved. But it's only for a time, and then the end is going to come. The description given in verse 10 pertains to the great tribulation when there will come a series of cataclysmic judgments, which even in that, you read Revelation, the Lord is merciful in the judgments to not just end it like, pull, do you're done, you know. It's like he, he goes, Revelations 8 and 9, the first, second, third, sixth trumpet judgments are all judgments consisting of fire, trying to get people to wake up. The fourth bowl judgment, Revelation 16, judgment of fire, just like it's speaking of here. If people refuse to tur turn from evil to God in the midst of those cataclysms, that's just expressing their unbending sinful hearts. There's going to be a transformation of the, this present world. Some people I've talked to, well, you know, I don't really need to repent. I don't feel any burden over my sin. It doesn't weigh me down. I say, sure, if you tie a large rock around a dog's neck and you throw him off the top of a large building, he doesn't feel the weight of the stone either on his way down. It's only when he hits the ground and bursts into a million pieces that the weight of that stone is fully realized. That's what happens when judgment comes. Oh, I don't feel it now. Well, you will, dude, when it hits. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be done away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. That word elements is the most minute parts of something. Peter is expressing how complete the coming judgment will be. Both the earth and the works in it will be burned up. That means the surface of the earth and every, every city, town, house, factory, palace, monument, all the things that people set up, you know, even, even Camp Randall, it's going to go down. All burned up, it says. Therefore, verse 11 since all these things will be dissolved. Speaking to us, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct, godliness, looking for, hastening 
the coming of the day of the Lord, because which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, the elements will melt with fervent heat. I can't force someone to examine the evidence and make wise decisions, but I can personally be living for more than an eventual pile of ashes. And this lengthy question Peter asks here, it's rhetorical. It's like, well, so how should we be living? Seeing what the eventual fate is. Now, you know, how should I be living now? It should be obvious. If I truly believe this, that that should be reflected in my lifestyle. If I don't believe it, it won't, it won't be, and I'll just be a fake. But see, according to verse 11, the life of a person who understands this and who genuinely believes what God's Word says, their, their life will be characterized by two things, holy conduct and godliness. Holy conduct refers to how I live my life in this evil world. It speaks of a life that is separate from the way that the unsaved world lives. Yeah, and again, it's not like being an Amish person or in a monastery. A few months ago, I, remember, I don't know if you remember, there was a national emergency alert test that rang every iPhone, every smartphone in the nation. It alerted everyone's smartphones. I don't know if you remember that. I do. It also included some Amish men who had their hidden phones in their pockets and their phone all of a sudden went off and they got shunned from their church. What do you got that thing for? They may be isolated, but they're not separate. I got to conduct myself in a holy way in the midst of this world where holy conduct refers to the way I live before the world. Godliness speaks of how I live before God. My prayer life, my devotional life, my fellowship, service to God. The first thing someone told me when I got saved, my wife and I just start serving in the church to do something where you have to be here. That's so the greatest thing about being a pastor. You got to be there. <laughs> you know, even if nobody else shows up, you got to be there. Thank you, God, because I do. But notice what he says in verse 12. Both of these things, in living this manner of life, they're both looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. The day of God is an in interchangeable term for day of the Lord. Reference and an obvious reference to the deity of Jesus Christ, by the way. But both are referred to the coming seven-year tribulation period. Looking for means I'm living in expectation of that coming day when the Lord finally brings an end to this madness that is called planet Earth. And I can't help but long for that. I long for the current pain and suffering to come to an end. And if that is truly my desire, then by having a lifestyle of holy conduct and godliness, Peter's saying that believers can hasten. We can accelerate the arrival of the Lord. This should bring you know, great anticipation and great incentive. He might not be on a timetable, but we are. And as the Lord's people here on earth, we are able to have an active part in seeing the Lord's work here on earth progress and accelerate. We do that through evangelism. Jesus said the gospel must first be preached to all nations. So once it's preached to all nations, he's going to come. Mark 13, 10. Before his kingdom on earth can be established, a great incentive to be preaching the gospel and telling every person and get the day of the Lord here faster. We hasten the day through our continual praying, Thy kingdom come. And even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. They're not just empty prayers. He told us to pray this way. Hasten the day. Both our witness to the world in an effort to see people get saved and our continual petitioning of the Lord through prayers, both are natural outgrowth of those living a, lives that are marked by holy conduct and godliness out of a longing for the Lord's return. I don't long for desire for the judgment, but my desire is for His future reign. Nevertheless, he says in verse 13, we according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now some see verse 13 as referring to the new creation 
the eternal age described in Revelation 21 is called a new heaven and a new earth. But the recreation of this current planet for the thousand year reign is also called new heaven and new earth in Isaiah chapters 65 and 66. It seems more plausible in this context, but also the fact Revelation was not yet written before Peter. But the new heaven, new earth spoken of in the last two chapters of Isaiah and referred to here describing what is called the kingdom age, the millennial kingdom where Jesus will reign on the earth, a restored earth for a thousand years. It's a glorious time that is coming. Satan will be bound, as it says in verse 13, righteousness will prevail upon the earth. And thus, I'm not looking for hastening the coming tribulation period and what takes place during that time, but for what that results in. It's just unfortunately the Lord's coming to earth to rule requires that transforming work of this earth from the filth to righteousness. As the Lord's follower, I desire that. As Peter did, we, he says, according to his promise, verse 13, look forward to and hasten the fulfillment of the promises of universal righteousness by living a righteous life now. And he further emphasizes, verse 14, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. In an effort to amplify the point, back in verse 12, if I'm someone looking forward to these things, he says in verse 14, then I'm to be diligent speaks of making every effort to apply myself to the furtherance of my spiritual life in order that I may be found by him in peace. Speaking of the peace that only Jesus gives, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And so these are the things here when the Lord returns, I'm not to be found striving, I'm to be found without spot and blameless, verse 14 says. And thus I'm diligent he says at the end of verse 14, to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider, verse 15, that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. So you need to view this present time of waiting for the Lord's return in terms of salvation. That should just be my mindset and everything. My salvation uh, as pertaining to sanctification and others' salvation as far as getting them saved. That's to be the focus of my life as a believer, being involved in getting the gospel out. And while well, there's still time, and Paul defers, or Peter defers to the Apostle Paul in this, just like our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking of them in these things, in which are some things hard to understand, untaught, unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of Scripture. Paul was used mightily by the Lord to develop what is called soteriology, the biblical doctrine of salvation. You see that emphasized in Romans, Galatians, Ephesians, but he touches upon it in every one of his epistles. The gift Paul had been given by the Lord was something Peter had come to acknowledge and respect. The book of Acts, second chapter of Galatians, record animosity between those two earlier in the days of the gospel, but Peter's reference to him here as our beloved brother, verse 15, shows those days were over. Peter speaks of Paul's writings as some things hard to understand. It's not that what Paul wrote was un un not understandable. It's just that Paul was a scholar. Peter was a fisherman. God will use whoever, thankfully. As he does, you know, that people will take them, however, because they can be hard and they'll twist them. Paul's epistles were considered scripture even at that early date. So Peter ends his epistle here, one final warning, it speaks to the topic of continuing. When he says in verse 17, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. 
seeing as they had been forewarned, seeing as I have been forewarned, I'm to beware, he says. That is a military term. It means to be on guard. I need to be guarding my walk. It's easy to forget that we're in a battle and the stakes are so high. My enemy doesn't want me to take my spiritual life and the application of Scripture seriously. When I come to do my devotions in the morning, he wants to say, oh, dude, just sleep in a little longer, you know, just breeze through them, whatever it is. It should be the most important part of my day, getting equipped. And to beware, lest I fall from my own steadfastness. A couple of years ago, Valdosta State University in Georgia, they were taken to court by a student who was suing them for falling out of her bunk bed. It's a, he told the, she told the court that the university neglected to include a notice concerning the risk and danger of falling from the bed. The institution, just a college student, okay? The institution held that the student had slept in the bunk for three months, had equal knowledge that the bed was raised off the ground and lacked guardrails before she fell off. The judge, he decided his decision concluded with the phrase, it has been unverifiably held, un universally held, excuse me, it's been universally held that no danger is more common nor poses a greater risk than falling. Just falling. And it's pretty sad, you know, it'd take a judge to rule that, but equally sad is that many professing Christians fail to beware that no danger is more common nor it poses greater risk spiritually than falling from my own steadfastness if I fail to take my relationship with the Lord seriously. This is what's so important as he ends this. Grace, and in, in growing, he says, I'm to continue growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So not surprisingly, I'm, I'm not told to grow in my abilities. I'm to grow in his. I'm to grow in the, understand, the undeserved love and favor that God has for me through the faith, my faith in Jesus Christ. You therefore, beloved, since you know this, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness and are led away by the error, but grow in the grace and knowledge. I'm to grow in the undeserved love and favor that God has for me through my faith in His Son. That can be one of the hardest resources. You know, we confess things today and all these things, one of the hardest resources for a sinful creature as myself to do is to access all that unmerited favor. Because I don't deserve God's love. I never have, I never will. The more I grow in my relationship with the Lord, the more I realize how undeserving I am. But Peter tells me in his final words here, it is through growing in that grace and knowing that his grace is, is infinite. As I grow in my knowledge of him, I have to rely upon his grace. I never thought I would have to put so much effort into receiving unmerited, unearned favor. That's probably the hardest part. That's the only way I'm going to grow in my knowledge, by living my life according to the abundance of grace, knowing that his grace is sufficient every time I fall. It's been purchased to me on the cross. We had a dog once. Our dog would sit by the table while we were eating, and the minute a crumb or a scrap would fall to the ground, the dog would race over and lick it up. He was just watched, dude, until one of the kids, we had seven kids, you know, one of them dropped something. He was a fat dog. But the minute, you know, a crumb fell, he would race over that. But if I took the whole plate of chicken or roast beef and I put the whole thing in front of him, he would sit there and salivate. He wouldn't eat it. It was too much for him. Even if I said, come on, you can do it. He would start wiggling and he'd salivate more, but he wouldn't do it because he's been trained. You don't do that or you get punished. How often I think that's how I must appear before God. Just throw me a crumb of grace and I'll lick it up, but set an infinite amount in front of me and I hesitate. I'll salivate. Oh, dude, I want it, but it's too much. 
Because I've been trained my whole life before coming to Christ. If you want something that valuable, you've got to earn it through years of hard labor or steal it. One of the two. You're just not given infinite riches. But that's why one of the first lessons I need to learn, I'm not just given infinite riches for free either. It's been paid for. A huge price has been paid, not, and just not by me. I just have to receive it, enjoy it, and with Peter say, to him be glory for now and forever. Amen. And so, Lord, that is our prayer, and we thank you, God, that as we just come to grips with our own personal sin and fighting these battles, Lord, that your grace is sufficient, it is infinite. God, you provided everything for this whole battle and for everything that we're going to go through. And so all glory, all power unto you, Lord Jesus, for now and forever. Amen.